Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, I want to take a look at different maneuvers and their effect on the heart from the perspective of afterload and preload and murmurs. In doing so, uh, I want to try and make this a little bit simpler. It was something that I struggled with a lot when I was in medical school, and I imagine maybe other people do, and if not, you know, you can skip over this video. But my aim is to explain this in a way that you never feel like you have to memorize this ever again, but rather can always work through and figure it out. And part of the reason I like teaching this is that I think it emphasizes the importance of understanding of basic sciences and uh, even very basic physics so that you do, in fact, never have to go ahead and memorize this ever again. So the most important thing here is remembering that Everything is a function of gradients. In this case, it's almost always going to be a function of a pressure gradient. Now, the most important rule here, and I know I go back to basic physics and chemistry a lot, um, and this really isn't any different, is that blood flows the path of least resistance. And this is super important to remember. That's the first important thing of understanding our murmurs. And it's really the cardinal rule when we discuss various maneuvers and how they affect murmurs. And like I said, I made this video so that you would understand it and never have to memorize it again and could work through it. So always remember that blood flows the path of least resistance. Now the next thing is we need to know what a murmur is. And to put simply, just like the Korotkoff sounds that we hear when we measure blood pressure, anytime flow is turbulent or non-laminar, it creates vibrations, and that results in sound. Murmurs are no different. It's what happens when blood moves across a valve that is stenotic or flowing in an inappropriate direction at an inappropriate time. So we need to know that murmurs are a function of blood flow turbulently. And again, that could be across a stenotic valve or a retrograde across an incompetent valve, etc. So now for the murmurs, there are two important things to note here. One is that the more blood flowing across the valve, the greater the sound or the louder the murmur. And then, again, point two, like we just mentioned, blood least resistance. Blood will travel the pathway of least resistance. And these are really the two important things for understanding, basically, and I'm saying basically because there are obviously exceptions, like, you know, hokum, which will be another video, is that that's really going to be the determinant of what affects our murmurs. Understanding those two things, more blood flowing across will increase the sound and that blood likes to go the path of least resistance. So next we need to define our terms. We need to define preload and we need to define afterload. Now preload is the amount of stretch. Experienced by the heart and is usually equated to the amount of blood return. On the other hand, afterload is the amount of pressure that the heart must pump against in order to get blood out to wherever it needs to go, be it into the lungs from the right ventricle or out to the body from the left ventricle. So it's very important that we do define preload and afterload in this case. So now that we've defined our terms, we can kind of start talking about the uh, valvulopathies and the maneuvers a little bit. And uh, in this video, especially because it's less than 10 minutes, we're not going to go through all of them. The point again is to explain the general topic so that you can always extrapolate and uh, you know, be able to come to an answer for any of these issues moving forward. So for this first example, let's start with aortic stenosis. And as we know, this is going to be a systolic murmur. And because it's a stenotic valve, it means that it's going to get louder when more blood crosses it. 
And so we're talking really about this part of our pathway. And you can see I've labeled this all the way across. And so the question really is, well, how do we get more blood to move across the valve? And there's one of two ways. We can either decrease the pressure that the left ventricle has to push against, or we increase, oop, I'm sorry, or we increase the pressure from the backside where the blood is coming from so that it's less likely to travel retrograde. What this means or translates to is if we can decrease our afterload or decrease the pressure that the left ventricle has to pump against, it will actually be easier to send blood forward across the valve, which will lead to an increase in our murmur. Or if we can increase our preload, this will also lead to an increase in our murmur because not only is there higher pressure from the backside that the blood does not want to travel backwards against, but we've increased the amount of blood in these parts of the heart. So you're actually going to end up sending more blood forward across the valve. And remember, we're not memorizing any of this. All we're looking at is the pressure gradients. Which way does blood want to travel? And if you fill the heart with blood, it doesn't want to go backwards, it's going to want to go forwards. And if you can decrease the pressure outside of the heart in the aorta and the peripheral circulation, it means that you will also send blood forward. So something say like hand grip, we'll say hand grip, which leads to an increase in our afterload or the increase in the pressure against which the left ventricle would have to push to get blood out would actually result in a decrease in the murmur because it makes it harder for the left ventricle to push blood out to the body across the valve. That would lead to more noise making. Similarly, something like standing from a squatting position or lying position would also lead to a decreased murmur because you decrease the preload to the heart. So you decrease the filling of the heart with blood and therefore result in less preload and less blood then moving forward. So I hope that all made sense for aortic stenosis. I'm gonna go ahead and erase all of this and I'm going to do the other part of this in blue while we talk about mitral regurgitation uh, I can't actually erase the green in our thing, I apologize. Um, so I will do anything for the mitral regurgitation in blue as to differentiate it. And in mitral regurgitation, we're looking here at the mitral valve, which is incompetent and allowing blood to move retrograde in it. Again, as we know, mitral regurgitation is a systolic murmur and occurs when blood moves backwards through an incompetent mitral valve when it's supposed to be moving forward through the aortic valve during systole. And all we're going to do is kind of look at the same kinds of issues in physics, that we, blood is going to travel the path of least resistance. So hand grip, for example, which will lead to an increase in afterload of the left side of the heart, which would make it harder to pump blood forward and out of the body, like so, would instead lead to louder regurgitation because blood does not want to move forward, it wants to move backwards because you've increased the afterload. Similarly, doing something like squatting, which is going to lead to an increase in blood volume within the heart, will lead to, as a result of just sheer more volume, will lead to more blood going across the incompetent valve, thus increasing the murmur. And then of course, anything that makes it easier for blood to be pushed forward, such as amyl nitrate decreasing the afterload or decreasing the preload to the heart, say by rapidly standing or valsalving will lead to decrease in the murmur. That's all for our introduction to maneuvers and how they affect heart sounds. If you're interested in seeing more in-depth analysis of each one of these, please comment below. But overall, the lesson you should be able to apply to all concepts. Check us out on Instagram at Count Backwards from 10. Subscribe below and stay tuned for the next video.